you don't get people to join you these days or to stay with you for long periods of time if you don't have a purpose that resonates with them that is sort of above and beyond making just profits i do believe in the power of technology to improve the world but only if you have an ability to constantly embrace it hello and thank you for listening to this episode of leadership 2050 a podcast about business leadership that's fit for the 21st century I'm your host Andrew White from Oxford University's Side Business School. My guest is the man who's been called a turnaround specialist in global tech circles, Rajiv Suri. For 25 years Rajiv worked for Nokia and as CEO reinvented the company following the sale of its handset business. 2 years ago he joined the global satellite communications company in Mossat. Where as CEO he has been focusing on growing the business purpose and leading the way in the sector on carbon neutrality. During our conversation, Rajiv shares his key leadership lessons including the importance of building belief and how to ride the waves of change. I started by asking him to tell us a little bit more about Imarsat. The company is over 40 years old, was founded by the United Nations to protect lives at sea. So safety at sea was is how the company started, and then we were also doing safety in the air. We've expanded a great deal over the decades. Uh, and we're now a leader in global mobile connectivity. We connect assets that move, whether they're on land, at sea, or uh, in the air. Uh, our primary customers are airlines, ships, governments, and Internet of Things users. Uh, so if you fly across an ocean, the chances are that you know, the cockpit is connected through in Marsat on an airline, and also at sea we connect so much of much in marine providing safety so uh, over a million seafarers know that if their ship is in trouble uh, they can press a button and help will be on its way thanks to inmarsat so essentially we're a global satellite mobile connectivity company so it's like in a, i mean you're not doing the emergency response but you are a critical part of the emergency infrastructure but also the management infrastructure of those assets that are in those global spaces so it essentially it's a key piece of of infrastructure where you don't have um local networks and local um landline infrastructures and things like that absolutely if you have no terrestrial connectivity the only way you connect it to a satellite and that's why you know wifi provision uh in commercial airlines and in, in business aviation providing the same in ships but also in a natural disaster right in marsat connectivity is available to coordinate rare efforts and you know, reconnected separate families we we do that a, a fair bit so our purpose is is great mm. you know providing safety uh, but also connecting for good mm. but also the purpose from what it sounds like was there from the beginning because you know if you were founded by the UN has a global role you know coming out of global governance um you weren't a company that went through the 2008 financial crisis and then suddenly realized you had to wake up to some of these things it sounds like it's been in there from the get go absolutely right yes so when i came to inmarsat i asked three questions of all employees in a very uh, short survey and i said what what do you want me to change what do you want me to absolutely not change and what advice would you give me and the one thing people did not want us to change is obviously the purpose because it's so fantastic we don't have to find one that's how we found it yeah but what did they want you to change what I'm so curious as to the other questions and you know what should you do i guess is uh you know that you must have got some interesting suggestions back from that were there, were there any common themes people wanted uh, growth because the company was not growing or was sort of let's say undershooting its potential for growth and over the last 2 years we have been one of the top 2 fastest growing companies in the sector and there are a lot of players in the sector there are 55 communication providers providing satellite connectivity and when you look at profitability ie ebitda we've been the fastest growing uh, ebitda company uh, for the last 12 months and and actually even before that so the last couple of years have been very good and i think people have embraced change we reset the ambition we increase the ambition we we did a few things right and you know people took care of the rest Yeah. So you know you're running a major company this is a FTSE 100 in on the UK market so it's one of the biggest companies in the UK but also has a huge global footprint by the nature of what you do. When you look back across the course of your life have there been things that occurred to you lessons that you learned maybe the good and the bad which are really shaping how you lead today how you form priorities how you make decisions um how you see the future? 
I think very early on, I learned the lesson of doing the right thing, right? So I, I believe greatly in ethics and integrity. So when I joined Nokia, remember, I'd already been working for seven years and, and to sort of restart at an engineer level was a bit of an, it was a hard pill to swallow at, at the time. But I was just, my gut feel said that Nokia is going to be the right company for me and I'm going to learn a lot. So I think that was the other thing. My career has always been about new experiences and learning new things. That's how I'm driven. It is about the potential to make an impact where there are at least three things that intersect, global and diversity, complexity and technology. Sort of when those things intersect, I, I tend to thrive. It's really about specific experiences that have taught me the continued desire to learn. And I, I'd say two of those experiences were quite profound when I became the CEO of Nokia Siemens Networks. You know, the company was stumbling. Uh, basically, it was a lag out of the sector. It was a financially very risky undertaking. The company was undercapitalized. There was deep change needed for company survival. I mean, it was, we were on the verge of bankruptcy. Our revenues were declining 21%. Can you imagine that? If you do that for two years, then you've halved your revenue. The parents, Nokia and Siemens, that the company, the management team had a plan. And so job losses, unfortunately, were a must. Asset sales were a must. But the goal was to keep the company alive and preserve as many jobs as possible and sort of get back to growth. And so we embarked on a solid and dramatic transformation. And uh, the result was that we created an industry leader with very strong profitability. We were punching way above our weight. Uh, the number one leader was two times our revenue, but we were making the same profit. So we moved from zero profit to about 1.5 billion euros of profit and this is non ifrs operating profit not not even uh so it's even stronger and uh cash generation was solid we were then hiring many people again and we were growing so it was hard but it was the right thing to do and it was it taught me many things and then after that when the mobile phones business of nokia on the other side of the fence was sold to microsoft i became ceo of all of nokia but now think about this right this is nokia needed something different it was traumatized by you know the failure of its mobile phone business fractured uh, the board was worried uh, still you know it was political there was more conflict versus consensus and so my approach was was different i wanted to create consensus wherever possible i wanted to give considerable focus to ethics and integrity i wanted personally to be accessible and responsive uh, empathetic listen engage and and you know inspire people by charting a bold path forward and so we went on to acquire Alcat Lucent. We acquired Motorola's infrastructure business. If you go back to 2005, 2006, Nokia's networks business, we were number six in the sector. Fast forward to 2016, 17, we became number two in the sector, the leading Western telecom infra company. We had moved from 6 billion euro revenue to about 25 billion euro revenue. Our profitability had come in you know, about 2.5 billion euro revenue. And so we moved from a failed devices company to the leading Western company in teleco infra. And we pretty much single-handedly consolidated the entire telecom infrastructure from about 10 players down to three scale players. So we acquired Nortel's business, Alcatel, Lucent, Bell Labs, uh, Motorola, Panasonic. And so it was just every couple of years, you know, so this was a very bold ambition that we undertook and you know, it was successful in the end. And that, that was very satisfying. Mm. I mean, it sounds like it, a lot of this was about giving people something to believe in. I mean, just the way you're talking, you're on the back foot. Nobody wants to be in an organization on the back foot where revenues are falling at 21%. And, and, and then when you started talking about bringing all these businesses in, there's a sense that we're building something. There's a sense of a vision, not just in a theoretical level, but a vision that's being implemented um, and, and we're part of something. Yeah, absolutely. And all I had was belief yeah. when I took over 1st October 2009 as Nokia Siemens Network CEO. I remember doing a a, a leadership uh, summit with about 75 top people and, you know, trying to translate that belief. And I remember on the first day, on the 1st first, first October 2009, when I took over, I did a media interview, you know, whatever, press conference. And, and I said that there'll be three scale players in the sector long term. We'll be one of them. I was laughed out because, you know, saying, wait a second, you're... You're a dying num number five right now. How are you going to be in, in business? Leave alone be one of the top three. So, but, you know, we needed people to believe. And that needed to start with me, that I believe. And then cascade that in, in all of the people. And, and people did believe. One of the good things Nokia was great at 
well, it's constant change. It's a 155 plus year old company and it started with paper and then rubber boots. And then, you know, people talk about Nova, mobile phone success, but that was 20 years in a 100 year plus job. Mm-hmm. And so I think the ability of people to adapt to change is, I think, made us who we are. And also tapping into its DNA. So in its DNA was this ability to reinvent. And so it knew how to do it. Sometimes it's just about remembering. Exactly right. Yes. You talked about, you know, where you are now within Marsat. And it's about, a cons- again, it's about consolidation. It's about kind of building something. So a lot of these lessons must be really helpful in terms of what you're trying to do in, in this job. It has been very helpful. Within Nokia, I did a number of jobs. And so I did technology jobs. I've done, you know, running a business unit. I've run a global account. I've run, you know, sales and account management. So just, you know, I've done a strategy role at the global level. So once you're able to put yourself out of these comfort zones on a regular basis, you have you develop the ability to have sort of greater learning agility. And so that's been very helpful because, I mean, space is more complex. It's different. It's been very useful to have that ability to learn, uh, but also to create the adaptability for change. Culture was great here, but we just needed to strengthen accountability to raise the level of ambition. So if you look at the sector, you know, the 55 satellite communication providers, a uh, number of players have talked to each other about consolidation never happened, right? So when I came in, I said, wait a second, something's got to give. I mean, we are lucky that we're in the growth part of the market, but most other players, I mean, satellites are used for a number of things. You can provide video broadcast, you sort of, you know, predict weather, you can provide consumers broadband service, or what we do, which is provide businesses and governments with the connectivity and, you know, far-flung remote places where there is no other form of connectivity. So uh, we were luckily in the sweet spot of the market, but most players were not growing including ourselves. And, and it was very clear to see from the outside that consolidation needs to happen. And so we became the first player to trigger that uh, because I believe that you can succeed in, in an industry when your neighborhood is good. So, I mean, you need structure to evolve and change. And now there are rumors that Intel, Sat, and SES will do their possible merger as well. So you can see that we've triggered the same thing we did in the network infrastructure business, not for the sake of it, but we did think that the industry needed to get to a healthier place because you have new billionaires coming into the industry with deep pockets like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos with their two constellations that are mega constellations. So we wanted to give ourselves the ability to get scope and scale. So in the first eight months, I was negotiating multiple deals with potential dance partners or, or buyers. At the same time, we were preparing the health of the company and improving ourselves to you know grow our potential luckily both have happened you know thanks to our people we have grown at the high end of the market the market grows at five or six percent we grow at nine percent ten percent uh our ebitda grows faster than our revenue because you want that to happen and we've been free cash flow positive the last couple of years allowing us to deleverage uh so it's been phenomenal but at the same time we've also upped our game in talking about things that matter to the industry, the decarbonization potential of satellites and, uh, you know, becoming uh, focused on climate change ourselves, whereas we are the only company in the sector that have agreed to uh, net zero targets by 2050 approved by the science-based target initiative. And I think the first company to recently have done a carbon neutral launch. So I really also wanted for us to be thought leaders in, in the industry where others understand what uh, what our contribution can be to society as a whole. Yeah. And that's what I was really going to ask you, Ibn, you know, given what's happening in the world today, from one point of view, what happened in telecoms was a bit of a precursor. That level of wave after wave of intense change is now hitting industries which have been stable for 40 years, like oil and gas, in the sense so you built muscle memory in telecoms that you can bring to others. So when you look around at your peers in the FTSE 100 or in the in, in, in the global businesses that you are relating to, what do you see as being the, the skills that leaders need today um, in terms of if you're going to run a large global company, what do you need in terms of leadership capability? I think you, you need to create the constant ability for companies to learn. People are adaptable to change. They embrace it. They welcome it because, I mean, there's going to be so much change. I think that's one. I think second, you need constant upskilling. And uh, we need a focus on purpose. I mean, we are lucky. We've had a good founding purpose. We've developed it. We have uh, expanded on it. You don't get people to join you these days or to stay with you for long periods of time if, if you don't have a purpose that, that resonates with them. 
uh, that is sort of above and beyond making just profits. And uh, I think, you know, those are some of the important lessons, you know, learning company, uh, adaptability of change, uh, focus on purpose, remember why you exist, or what impact you make uh, to society, not just as a company, but also as an industry. I do believe in the power of technology to provide productivity to industries and to improve the world, but only if you have an ability to constantly embrace it. I guess it's like change is no longer episodic. It's not just every five years or 10 years. My sense is it's a continual process. And I think actually the word change or transformation, they're reaching their limits. We should be talking about being in a state of evolution. Yeah. And, and I guess you're, I'd be interested to know your first, the first um, zero carbon launch you did. You must have seen a lot of these things coming to bear in a quite an intense way because it can't have been easy um, to get the carbon that you produce down to zero um, for an activity like that. Yeah, because for an activity like that, you do consume a lot of emissions. You burn a lot. Right? You yeah. burn a lot. Yeah. And so you have to offset them with a number of other initiatives uh, that allow you to uh, completely offset uh, the carbon that's emitted. And so what we did was, but it was a carbon neutral event in accordance with the carbon neutral protocol. And so, and that is a leading global framework for carbon neutrality. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're measured externally. The other thing we did is, like I said, that we are the first satellite communications company in the world to commit to being net zero by 2050. And again, this is scope one, scope two, scope three, and it's validated by the science-based targets initiative. So whatever we do, we want to be able to be able to validate and measure it. Uh, so that was fantastic. It was, it was, uh, people felt great about it. And the other thing we've worked on is that I commissioned a research report on um, what on earth is the value of space, uh, you know, about last year. And we started to understand that what is the decarbonization potential of space technologies, right? And it's sort of not well known that, you know, you already, the space industry does 22.5%, reduces 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we studied three sectors, energy, transportation, agriculture, forestry, and other land use. So as we studied this, we said, okay, so we're already providing 2.5% uh, reduction. Uh, what if we deploy these uh, nascent technologies more widely? That number, and, and, and sort of add in the mix some advanced technologies that are not yet available, the potential is not just 2.5%, it goes to about 18%. Wow, okay. And so we said that that could be so massive that it could potentially even bring forward net zero from 2050 to maybe 2045 or even 2040. So it is also our job as an industry to be able to build that awareness of, of what the potential of decarbonization is from our industry uh, you know, put together. So that, that was uh, very revealing. So this is about taking technologies that you've developed in the space industry and then applying them into other industries to bring about decarbonization. So, for instance, we have a we have something called IRIS that we're partnering with the European Space Agency to do. And what that does is that will allow you to have better modernize the air traffic management systems through these trajectory based operations that uh, allow you to go for green routes. And so those green routes will allow you to optimize fuel. And if you deploy it around the world, you can get there by maybe 2040 or 20, late 2030s um, in all the countries of the world. So imagine the potential of that. So a number of things you can do already today, but also new technologies that are coming our way. So do you, th I mean, I've often thought that, you know, 2050 seems a long way away. The scientists are telling us we need to get there sooner. And part of me thinks, actually, we need to be more ambitious. We need more innovation, but not just more innovation. We need that innovation deployed quicker. We need it, you know, because some of it, as you're saying, is already there. Um, so this is about pushing. It's not necessarily being more creative, although I think that's needed, but it's sometimes it's about pushing harder, um, being bolder. Fully agree. It is about being bolder. It's applying what you already have more widely. These technologies can buy you time before you get to carbon capture technologies and other things you need to do down the line that needs more innovation, more creativity and, and sort of, um, you know, uh, so yes, I, I think it is about pushing harder what you have, becoming bold and, and um, advancing some of those new technologies and deploy it to other places more widely and then invent new things that will help climate change. Yeah. And can I touch on something else? Because you talked about purpose and you talked about learning um, and this is about people. And many of us start our careers, we learn some stuff, we then deploy it, our careers grow. But there's a sense we're having to 
perhaps reinvent might be a strong word, but we're having to learn a lot of new skills. Um, and there's a sense that learning becomes part of what we do, what we do in life. And it becomes a much, uh, in a sense, it's a muscle that's easily, more easily flexed. Is, is that what you're seeing is that actually this is about human potential and it's about deep listening um, and this requires a different type of leadership approach, really. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. The organization requires a different kind of leadership approach. Uh, you're constantly upscaling, you're adding digital dexterity. Uh, most high value work in the future will be cognitive in nature. Employees will have to apply creativity, uh, critical thinking, constant uh, digital upscaling to solve you know complex problems. So. I think for me, what's going to be more and more important is encourage leadership at all levels, sort of decentralize more, distribute sort of more empowerment in the organization. People closest to the decision should be able to make those decisions. And that's some of the things we try to do here at Inmarsat, right? Just, you know, why are so many things to the top? Why don't we just push it down uh, and, and, and delegate more effectively and decentralize more effectively? It doesn't mean in an organizational sense. It means in, a, in an ability to make decision sense. So I think encourage leadership to all levels is going to be important. Uh, this upskilling, I think, you know, developing a company where people almost choose their ne next jobs based on learning, not about money or sort of going up the ladder necessarily or the traditional metrics that people have applied. Uh, obviously, some of those things are important too, but imagine if, you know, learning is number one. And this is not being altruistic. This is just about, you know, becoming a learning organization. Passion and purpose, right? I think people uh, do not just work for, for money. Um, you know, employees want to make a meaningful social impact. And, and I think people will actively seek opportunities to tie the impact and value of their work to the mission, purpose, and, and passion of the company. I joined, in 2018, I joined the board of Stryker, which is a medical technology company uh, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mission to be involved in healthcare. I'd always said, if I'm going to join an external board, I'd love it to be in healthcare. When, when that came my way, it's like, what a gift. And I remember interviewing with the CEO and, and the chairman. And he said, like, why do you want to join us? I said, what's, what's not to like? Look at look at your mission. And when we talked about the values of the company, I got even more inspired. And it's been a wonderful journey over the last five years. So I think this also rings true with what we do at Inmarsat. So when we have been talking about, you know, thought leadership, things like decarbonizing a number of sectors, uh, taking the high road on issues such as space sustainability, I've said that, to have net zero on Earth, you need, have, you need to have net zero in space. Because the other thing to be important is that space has a finite orbital carrying capacity. And now if you go back to the consolidation comment I made earlier, there are so many mega constellations coming very close to Earth in low Earth orbit, and they are going to create a number of risks. Orbital exclusion, that uh, there'll be so many thousand satellites in just you know one orbit that nobody else can come into that orbit. So if you're a country or a company that wants to come into that orbit, it's, you're excluded. The second is space debris and collision avoidance and you know risks to space astronomy, light pollution. So aluminum being uh, burnt in the Earth's upper atmosphere means creates climate change issues again um, you know, back down here. And so I'm asking for uh, not just a code of conduct as to how the industry does business, but perhaps even regulation because I've uh, I think we've all observed that when it came to climate change, uh, self-discipline didn't get us there. So you need something great and stronger. And so we've taken a very strong position in the matter of space sustainability for, for all. Hmm. I mean, you can see it with the inefficiency around the rollout of mobile telephone masts and the networks. And, you know, it required governments in some cases to step in and say in emergency situations, if I'm on one network, then my phone should be able to roam onto another network without any problems. And, you know, these networks are common goods. And I think what you're saying is to an extent, you've got to have the private sector in there, but the networks also have a common good to them. Yes. Particularly if you're in a ship at sea and you press the red button on the radio for, you know, because you have a fire or a flood or something else on board, you, you know, the competition between providers shouldn't really play out at that point. You said it well. So thank you. We've we've had a you know covered a lot of ground. Um, I'd like to finish with seven questions that I use with all the guests. Um, and the first one is, which leader from history inspires you most? Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, is from the Nobel laureate Bob Dylan, who's who's now eighty one years old. I think I like what he said about you should always take the best from the past, uh, leave the worst back, 
there and um, you know go forward into the future. Uh, why does this resonate with me? Because I think it suggests a tolerance for failure. And I'm a firm believer that you know every company should have a tolerance for failure. You should celebrate and learn through your mistakes because if you're not failing, you can't develop a fail-fast culture. Experiment, make mistakes, and then move on. Uh, learn from them. Thank you. And which leader today inspires you most? I'm not sure there's one leader, Andrew. I, I think it's something from each. I like uh, uh, what Microsoft CEO Satya has been able to do with uh, reinventing uh, Microsoft. Uh, I like what you know Amazon, Amazon did with uh, what Jeff Bezos did with sort of uh, the day one uh, culture and, and, and staying with this constant innovation in the multiple uh, areas over time and uh, using something that was developed for internal use, Amazon Web Services, to, to make it a sort of thriving business. So it depends. Uh, there are some leadership attributes from different leaders I, I've uh, been energized by. Thank you. And which book has made the most impact on you? From a leadership point of view, I'd, I'd say that uh, Good to Great from Jim Collins made quite an impact, and especially that set talked about level five leadership and how level five is different from level four and, and humility and how one must be grounded. Yeah, I love that, his paper in Harvard Business Review, which I think is a couple of decades old now. I think he put his finger on something which a lot earlier than, and in a sense, the idea matured to a point where people realized it, particularly after 2008 that it was about fierce ambition, but also profound humility. And it was the combination of the two, um, which is so important. No, I couldn't agree more with you. And when, you, when you're promoting people, uh, what characteristic do you look for? Curiosity. Uh, those who are engaged, uh, they have an ability to ask the right questions. They're willing to learn. And they develop a knack of asking searching questions. And searching questions get you collectively to the right answers. And what inspires you in the younger generation? I think three things, uh, their ability to take risks, potential ability to dream big, their ability to adapt and welcome change, but also that they are natively more open to diversity and inclusion. And what makes you hopeful about the future? The potential and power of technology. I just, I just, I'm passionate about creating you know, value, innovation, delivering technologies that, that have a positive impact on people's lives. You know, When I was in my previous job at Nokia, I thought 5G would make a profound impact on nations uh, and the industrial sector by helping provide new forms of productivity and whether or not there'll be new consumer applications, we'll see about that. That may take time with virtual reality, metaverse and other things, but I've talked about you know what we can do in the space sector and that's been very interesting, especially with regard to decarbonization. And finally, it can't be easy running a company with the size and scale. Your operations are on 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the world. So where do you go for kind of inspiration for renewal to kind of recharge the batteries? I think that uh, having this balance in, you know, in your work and life is very important. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you've got to be passionate about work and I am and always will be, but not the exclusion of the fullness of a life well lived. So uh, I want to socialize. I want to have quality time with friends and family. I want to do things that I enjoy. Family is very important to me. Uh, I love spending time with my family. We're all in London. Our three dogs, love to spend time with them. Uh, my two sons, uh, my wife and I tend to take regular holidays uh, during year, short, but sort of regular. And then fitness is a very important part of my life. About an hour and a, hour and a half gym session every day, I, I will make it a point to walk about 10 kilometers and preferably if it's close to nature. My thanks to Rajiv Suri. My name is Andrew White, and you've been listening to Leadership 2050. Don't forget, you can find all our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And please do take a moment to rate and review us. If you'd like to hear more from Side Business School, exploring leadership and how the business world is reimagining the future, please visit OxfordAnswers.org. Leadership 2050 is produced by Eve Streeter. Original music is by Cy Begg. Our executive producer is David Maguire for Stable Productions. In the next episode, I'll be joined by Daniel Hooft, the CEO of Kelp Blue, a blue water farming company that is changing the world of the oceans. Until then, many thanks for listening. <laughs>